So all of the notes you pretty much need are in this handout. If you need to add more notes, then you can certainly write on the margins. I would recommend putting your name on the handout just in case you misplace it. But in this first unit, we're looking at sequences and series. This covers textbook sections 1.1 to 1.5. So it's all of chapter one. We're going to be solving problems using sequences and series. And there's two main types of sequences and series. Arithmetic, and that's how it's pronounced. Arithmetic and geometric. And then we're also going to be looking at infinite geometric series. So to begin with, when you look at the top of any lesson, a couple of things I want to point out to you that the nomenclature, the, the numbering rule here guides you to the textbook. So if at the end of this lesson there's something you don't understand, uh, maybe you should go to the textbook and look at it from a different angle because my examples and notes are different than the textbooks. Okay. And then you will also find your objectives. So if you take a look actually at what we're doing today, there's a boatload of things we're doing today. But I mean, and I could read through them all, but they're not going to make sense to you because we haven't done them yet. Right. So if I say identify arithmetic sequences, identify finite and infinite sequences, if you don't know what that means, well, that's understandable. We haven't learned it. But at the end of the lesson, if you go back and look at this, it should all make sense. Okay. So to begin with here, we're going to define what a sequence is. A sequence is a set of numbers that has a particular order. Okay. Now, they don't always have to be numbers, but they most of the time are numbers. They could be algebraic expressions instead. But we're going to start off simple with numbers. Each of the pieces in the set is called a term. And we'll look at specific examples here in a second. And the sequence may be finite or infinite. The word infinite means it goes on forever. And the word finite means it ends at some particular point. And these numbers, this set of numbers, usually forms a pattern. I mean, I guess a sequence could be a set of random numbers, but there's normally a pattern. So if we take a look at some examples here, 1, 3, 5, 7, etc., there's a pattern there. And incidentally, everybody, the goal in this course and in this unit is not for you to be able to figure out necessarily what the pattern is specifically. Okay? It's not like we're approaching this from a puzzle solving standpoint. It, that will become clear in a, in a few minutes, but there's definitely a pattern here. And we could say that these numbers are the set of all of the odd numbers greater than zero. Or you could say that the first term is one, and every time you want to go forward in the sequence to the next term, you add two. You could do that. Uh, there's a sequence here, three comma negative six comma 12 comma negative 24. With a little bit of thought, just by a show of hands, how many of you do know what the pattern is? What do you think it is, Jay? Yeah, you're multiplying by negative two every time. Three times negative two is negative six. Negative six times negative two is 12. 12 times negative two is 24. Uh, one, two, four, eight, 12, 16, 20, not really a pattern that it, it appears to be two patterns. It looks like it starts off by taking one and doubling it to get two and then doubling to get four and doubling to get eight. And then after that, it's just plus four, plus four, plus four, plus four. But there's a pattern. Um, anybody want to take a stab here? Remember, you have to show your hands. Don't just show things out what you believe this pattern is. One, four. 9, 16. Have you got it? Is it Josh? Yeah, it's like 4 minus 1. So it's like you can take 4 minus 1, add 2 to the 1, then 9 minus 4, add 5 to the 4. Oh, that's interesting. The difference between, uh, you're saying, what are we doing? We're subtracting these two to get. Okay, will that work over here with the 9 and the 16? Yeah. I've never thought of it that way. That's interesting. Is there another way to look at it? Have you got it? They're the perfect squares. 1 squared, yeah. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. Or you could say 
to go from one to four, you add three. And then from four to nine, you add five. And from nine to 16, you add seven. So you're adding all of the odd numbers. Well, not all of them, but you're adding odd numbers that grow every time. Um, 14, 10.57, 3.5. What's happening there is you're losing, I believe, 3.5 each time. And through the course of this lesson, I'm not a, a big, let's use our calculator kind of teacher, but we will need our calculator to crunch some numbers. Uh, this is an interesting one that we'll get back to in a bit. One, one, two, three, five, eight. Just curious. Does anybody know what the next entry in that final one is? Do you know? It is 13. Have you seen this sequence before somewhere? You have. Yeah. I, I would say that probably if you see it for the first time, you won't quite get where the 13 comes from unless you think about it a little bit. And we're going to talk more about that sequence in a bit. So those are some examples of sequences. Now, what we want to focus on today are called arithmetic sequences. And, and it's, it's spelled the same way the word arithmetic is, but we call it arithmetic. An arithmetic sequence is a sequence in which the difference between successive terms is always the same number. Successive terms mean two terms that are after each other, one after the other. The amount by which the successive terms differ is called the common difference. And I'll give you an example in a second here. And that common difference can be found by taking a term and subtracting the previous term. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. There really is. The common difference, think about this for a second. If you take a term and subtract the one before it to get the common difference, then the common difference is what you add to a term to go forward. Okay. If we take a look at this sequence, 1, 3, 5, 7, etc., there's a common difference of 2. And there, there are two ways to look at this, and this is really important. It's simple. The numbers are simple, but the concept can be complicated. The reason why the common difference here is 2 is because if I take the first term, which is 1, and add 2 to it, I get the second term, which is 3. If I add 2 to that, I get the next term, which is 5. If I add 2 to that, I get the next term, which is 7. So this is arithmetic. But the other way we can see what the common difference is, is to take a term like 7 and subtract the one before. 7 minus 5 gives you 2. 5 minus 3 gives you 2. 3 minus 1 gives you 2. So there are two ways to look at it. The common difference is what you add to one term to move forward in the list, or the common difference is what you get when you take a term and subtract the one before. You catch my drift here? Okay. So I would like you, this is arithmetic. I'm just going to put check marks beside the arithmetic ones. And the common difference is 2. I would like everybody to begin by putting check marks beside any of those that are also arithmetic. The word common is important. So if you find that you have to add 5, I don't know that this would be true up here, but if you find you have to add 5 to the first term to get the second, then you add 5 to the second and you don't get the third, then there's not a common difference. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have identified all of the remaining sequences that are arithmetic? Just a couple. Give you another minute. That is not arithmetic. 3, negative 6, 12, etc. is not arithmetic. Because what do I add to 3 to get negative 6? Well, let's just see here. I'm a number line kind of guy. 
There's three on the number line. There's negative six. What I have to add to three to get negative six is negative nine. So I have to add negative nine to three to get negative six. Now the question is, what happens if I add negative nine to negative six? Do I get 12? Well, no, I get negative 15, don't I? I mean, it's, it's obvious I'm not going to get 12. And that's why that's not arithmetic. Here, I add 1. I add 2. Okay, right away, not arithmetic. Because the difference between the terms is not the same. Uh, 1, 4, 9, 16. Well, I add 3. From 1 to 4, I have to add 3. Then from four to nine, I have to add five. Well, three and five are not the same number. The difference is different. What do I add to go from 14 to 10.5? I add negative 3.5. So now I want to just pause for a second here. By a show of hands, and I, I ask these questions this way sometimes because I need to know what I'm dealing with in terms of trying to help you. How many of you understand looking at 14 going to 10.5 that you add negative 3.5 by just looking at the numbers? Okay. If you don't, and you don't know that it's negative 3.5, then do what we learned a minute ago. Take a term and subtract the one before. And I, I actually want you to try this on your calculator. Take 10.5 minus 14. You get negative 3.5. Take 7 minus 10.5. Negative 3.5. Take 3.5 minus 7. Negative 3.5. So anytime you take a term and subtract the one before it, you're always getting the same thing. And that means that this one is an arithmetic and the common difference is negative 3.5. I, I mean, I, I really hope this isn't the case, everybody. But if you can't see that the common difference of this first one is 2, then you're in real trouble in this class. But if you absolutely had to convince yourself that it's 2, take 7 minus 5, you'll get 2. Take 5 minus 3, you'll get 2. Okay. Any questions with that first part of the warm-up? Okay, do you happen to know what this sequence is called? What is it? It's called the Fibonacci sequence, and it's an amazing sequence. We deal with it in calculus quite a bit. It's a sequence of numbers. I'll show you the numbers in a second. It's a sequence of numbers that appears in nature. It appears in the mating habits of rabbits, believe it or not. It appears in probability problems that we deal with in Math 30-1 and calculus. This is the sequence. So when you read this, the guy on the left says one cheesy tortilla chip and he eats it. And his buddy says one cheesy tortilla chip gets eaten. Then he eats two, then the next guy eats three, then five, then eight. And this is called the Fibonacci sequence. And this one guy says, what's wrong with Fibonaccios? So they're eating Fibonaccios. They're following the Fibonacci sequence. And the problem is, He's looking at the bowl and saying there's only 12 left with a full mouth, but they need 13. How did you get the 13? You add the 8 and the 5. You add the two previous terms. So the first term is 1. The second term is 1. You start with that. The third term is found by adding these two. The next term is found by adding these two. So you always go back two terms and add them to find out what the next one is. So the next term here would be whatever 8 plus 13 is. Just a point of curiosity. You don't need to know that for this course. Okay, let's take a look at some further warm-up. In an arithmetic sequence, T1 equals 5. And listen, the reason why I'm giving you this as part of a warm-up is so we get used to what the terminology and the structure of how we write these things exists, what the structure looks like. When I say T1, T1 means the first term. 
So this little subscript here, everyone, this little subscript is telling you where in the list of numbers that term is. However, this number is telling you the value of the term. And there's a difference between the subscript, which is telling you where it is, and what the whole thing is equal to telling you what it is. So T1 is 5, and the common difference is 3. This is like stealing candy from a weak and tired baby. It's very simple. We add 3 each time to get the next term. This would be 8. This would be 11. This would be 13. Is my arithmetic correct? That is to say, when I add, no, it should be 14. Eh? I can bluff and say I put that in there to keep you on your toes, but I did make a mistake. It's 14, right? Is my ar arithmetic correct now? Okay. Any questions with that? Okay. Continuing on with something that is about notation, we have an infinite arithmetic sequence. You can tell it's infinite because it has that dot, dot, dot. And by the way, I don't know if I asked you up here. I didn't ask you for the infinite and the finite, but this would be infinite. This would be infinite. This is finite. These two are infinite, and that one is finite. Right? So we're given this infinite sequence. Can everybody take a minute and either in your head or with your calculator confirm that it's arithmetic? Aoki, how do you know it's arithmetic? I'm adding 3 every time. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. Negative 1 plus 3 is 2. 2 plus 3 is 5. And if you weren't sure, I, I'm a little worried if you can't see that you're adding 3 each time. But if you're unsure, take a term and subtract the one before it and just keep repeating that. But the common difference is definitely 3. So the common difference is 3. We can put that in. And it says complete the table to the right. And I. This is something that even the best student is going to get mixed up on with the language. That there's a difference between saying term number and term. When I say what is the term in a sequence, I'm asking you what the value of that thing is. If I say what is this term? The answer is it's 2. That term is 2. If I say what is that term number, the term number is 3, exactly. And that's why I've got in brackets here, under the highlighted green term, I've got value. Because sometimes I will throw that in and I, I will say, well, we want to find the term. And students will be confused and I'll go, well, OK, we're trying to find the term value. What is the value of the term that's in that position? So the term number, the term number for this is 1, because it's the first term. The term number here is 2. The term number here is 3. The term number here is 4. So these numbers are telling you where in the list they are measured from the beginning. Whereas the term value is negative 4. Or the term is negative 4. This term is negative 1. This term is 2. This term is 5. Okay? And we have to complete the table. So what is the notation to describe this term? We would say t1 equals negative 4. And that piece of information is telling you it's the first term, and it's telling you the value of the term, which is negative 4. This would be t sub 2 equals negative 1. So you know, maybe a way to look at it is that subscript is a label. It, that's all it is. It's a label. It's just telling you which term it is. t3 is 2, and t4 is 5. And now comes a difficult problem. Well, difficult for many people. 
no matter how good you are at math, I'm presenting you with a problem here that seems like a complicated one. I'm asking you, what is T15 equal to? I'm asking you to find the 15th term. And it's not that difficult if we want to write them all out, right? Negative four, negative one, two, five, eight. We could keep doing that, couldn't we? Until we've counted off 15 terms. In other words, we could extend that table and just fill in all of them. Well, let's find out if you can do it without doing that to begin with. I'm going to give you a minute to see if you can figure out what it is on your calculator. Do you know? No. It's a difficult problem. It's not a simple question. It is 38. Yeah. But when you put up your hand, just for future reference, when you put up your hand, wait, wait for me, because I wanted to give everybody else a minute here. It is going to be 38. And you did it in here, and I did it in here. And did anybody else kind of figure out that it would be 38? A couple people, yeah. So let's confirm that it's 38. I'm going to continue to add 3 each time. 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, 26. I better stop and double check my math. Plus 3, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3, plus 3. 29, 32. 35. This is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth term. So the fifteenth term is 38. Can you explain how you did that? Do so you have a formula? You've learned the formula in another class. Okay. Did anybody else get it and can explain what you did mathematically to get the answer? Brilliant. What, Charlie? Liberty. liberty. I'm sorry, and I will. I will get that straight. What Liberty has done is she has said to go from here to here is 14 jumps, isn't it? But that means it's 14 common differences because each jump to go forward one term is a common difference. And if we want, we can say that that's 14 common differences, and that means that's 14 times the 3, which is 42. So it looks like we have to add 42 to the first term to get the 15th term. So if you add 42 to this, you're going to get 38, and you use the formula. Let me ask you a question. In your formula for the first term, do you use A or T1? A. Okay. We use T1. We used to use A, but I don't know why they changed it. So you'll have to get used to that, but it's not a big deal. Um, what about this one, 44? Let's see if we can do this the way Liberty, Liberty, the way Liberty did for the previous question. What you would do is you would say, that 44 minus that negative 4 has to be a certain number of common differences. This is a little bit more complicated, though. Okay, So if we do that, you end up with 48, and this is equal to a certain number of common differences, which is 3. What do you get for the number of common differences? 16? So 16 times 3 is 48. But, and this will become better tomorrow with a formula, okay? If you add 16 common differences to the first term, you do not get the 16th term. You get the 17th term. So that means that this has to be 17. 
As I said, tomorrow we're going to see a formula. We're going to develop a formula that can be used to solve these problems. All right, let's turn the page, please. So now I'm going to introduce the concept of what's called a general term. A general term is a formula that you can use to find any term from the term number in a particular sequence. In this particular case, this sequence here has a general term of p sub n equals 3n minus 7. What this is, what this general term is, is something that you put n into and get tn out of. Oh, is it still on the first page? I oh, my mistake. I said turn the page and it wasn't. Thank you. Uh, what this general term is, is something that you put n into and get tn out of. And now comes one of the first points regarding the terminology that we were talking about earlier. This is a term number. This is a term value. So what this is claiming is that if you put 1 in for n, that will calculate the first term. If you put 2 in for n, it will calculate the second term. And it's asking you to confirm that. So if I put, I mean, look very carefully here. I, I believe I gave you a table, didn't I? No? Okay, so we can make our own table. Look very carefully at what I'm doing here. If I say n equals 1, then what that means is that I have to put a 1 in that formula wherever there's an n. And that formula is going to become t sub 1 equals 3 times 1 minus 7. And you can work that out. That's negative 4. Whoops, one red. That's negative 4. If I wanted to know what t sub 2 is, then I have to change the n's to 2. And when you work that out, you get negative 1. I'm going to throw something your way and see if it sticks. And if it doesn't, it might stick later, maybe tomorrow or maybe the next day. Looking at this, you should understand why the common difference has to be 3. Because n is going to go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. Every time you increase n by 1, you're multiplying that extra 1 by a 3. So the whole value goes up by 3 each time. Anyway, if we put 3 in, I'm not going to show the substitution. 3 times 3 minus 7 gives you uh, 2. If I put 4 in, 3 times 4 is 12. Minus 7 is 5. And you can confirm that what's happening is as n goes up by 1 each time, the term value goes up by 3 each time. You getting the gist here of what's going on with an arithmetic sequence? OK, let's turn the page and take a look at some examples now that continue to expand on this. For the sequence defined by t sub n equals 5n plus 8, what are the first four terms? Well, if we put 1 in for n, and I'm not going to show this work. Listen, if this were any kind of written response test or assignment, you would show your work. But I think the numbers are so basic. 5 times 1 plus 8 is going to give you 13. I will show that first substitution. t sub 1 equals 5 times 1 plus 8. This is how you get t1, 13. If I put 2 in, then I'm going to have 5 times 2 plus 8, which is 18. 
which is adding 5 to the previous term. If I put 3 in, I'm going to get 23. 4 will give me 28. The first four terms are 13, 18, 23, 28. What is the value of the first term and what is the value of the common difference? The first term is 13. Whoops. The first term is 13. The common difference is 5. Again, I'm going to throw something your way and maybe it sticks, maybe it doesn't. The first term will always be the sum of the numbers in the general term. 5 plus 8 is 13. The reason why that's going to work is the first term uses n equals 1. So the 5 times the 1 is going to give you that 5. The common difference is always the coefficient of n. So if we go back to this one, 3 plus negative 7 is negative 4. The common difference is 3. So you certainly don't need to use the formula for a question like this. Uh, what's t13? Well, that just means we're going to put 13 in here. And I'm a big fan of using tables when we talk about inputs and outputs and x's and y's. So we put 13 in. That would be 5 times 13 plus 8, which by my count is 73. Yeah, is that right, Aoki? 73. So the 13th term, 73. Any questions with example 1? We're still kind of warming up to this idea. It's not that difficult yet. For each arithmetic sequence, determine the values of T1 and D and fill in the missing terms. Now, listen, you're going to encounter this approach, what I'm going to talk about, in lots of places in this course. Just because I tell you to do three things, find the first term, find the common difference, fill in the blanks, doesn't mean you have to do them in any particular order. You should be adept enough to look at this and say the common difference is 4. I mean, I don't even know what we would need to write there. I guess you could say t4 minus t3 has to give you the common difference, which would mean 19 minus 15 gives you the common difference, which means 4 equals d. One of the things I'm going to, as I say, pull over and just take a break here for a second. One of the things that I'm going to do my best to teach you in this course transcends content. There are certain things in math that are math skills that you need to really get better and better at. And I'm going to tell you right now, you should never do any kind of algebra left to right. You should always work down. Okay? You may not appreciate right now, you probably won't appreciate right now why that's good advice. But as soon as you start going equals, 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 you run into all kinds of serious mathematical problems and errors. Okay. So anyway, we get a common difference of 4. That means we can subtract 4 to get 11, subtract 4 to get 7, subtract 4 to get 3. We now know the first term is 3. We know the common difference is 4. How's my arithmetic? Okay. All right. Now this one is going to be solved in much the same way that Liberty found that that last term that I think it was the 15th term was that the one? Yeah. And the idea is this that to go from here to here requires that you add a common difference. To go from here to here requires that you add a common difference. And to go from here to here requires that you add a common difference. And that means that to go from 7 to 13 requires that you add three common differences. Yep. 31, thank you. To go from 7 to 31 requires that you add three common differences. And the reason for that, and some of you will not see this immediately, it's a little more abstract, 
is this is the second term and this is the fifth term. And the difference between two and five is three, right? So you don't necessarily have to draw those little leapfrog arcs, but you need to understand that to go from the second to the fifth term is three common differences. This is a very simple linear equation. We subtract seven from both sides and end up with 3D equals 24. We divide both sides by three and get D equals eight. And what I would say to you, each and every one of you, is solving this equation is child's play. You just, you subtract seven, divide by three. I'm not even sure we need to show any work here in our notes. It's that simple. Okay. Uh, so now that we know the common difference is eight, we can add eight to seven. We can add eight to 15. And if we add eight to that 23, we had better get 31, right? Because if we don't, then it's not a common difference and we've screwed up somewhere. But 23 plus 8 is, in fact, 31. Going the other way, let's subtract 8. First term is negative 1. Common difference is 8. We've got the terms filled in. Are we okay with that? Any questions with that example? All right. In an arithmetic sequence, the first term is 12 and the fifth term is 30. Algebraically determine the common difference and find some terms. A couple of points I want to make. First of all, algebraically. Algebraically does not mean writing down a bunch of numbers and figuring it out like you're solving a puzzle. That's not what algebraically means. Algebraically does not mean doing it on your calculator. Algebra is symbolic mathematical language. It means to solve this using algebra, which involves symbols and equations. So we're trying to find the common difference, algebraically speaking, if we have 12, second term, third term, fourth term, and then the fifth term is 30, we need to set up an equation based on this. An equation is the algebra. And what many of you might do is you have in your mind some way to just kind of, oh, well, it's obvious. Like Rain Man, you're just seeing it. Or Neo in the Matrix, where you're just seeing everything. It's just perfectly clear. We want to be able to show our thoughts on paper, and the best way to do that is with algebra. So what you can do here is say that 12 plus 1, 2, 3, 4 common differences will have to give you 30. Now that's algebra. Now we solve it. Incidentally, when we have a formula tomorrow, there's a way to solve this using algebra with the formula as opposed to doing this. Uh, subtract 12 from both sides. By my count, 30 minus 12 is 18. Divide both sides by four. According to my somewhat tired brain, that's 4.5. Half of 18 is nine. Half of that would be a quarter. And that means that the common difference, we can answer this question now, is 4.5. So to find the second, third, and fourth terms, we add 4.5 each time. Again, double check my math here. I think those numbers are right. And as a double check, as a, well, it makes me happy mathematically if there is such a thing, I want to add that 4.5 to 24.5 and hopefully get that last term of 30. And it, it is. Okay. So this pleases me. Well. It's much more exciting things in life. But in terms of doing a problem on an exam and, and confirming that you did it right, that's helpful. Questions with three? All right. And I believe we have one more question.
what is the 120th term of this sequence? And we have to do it algebraically. We can't, I, and I have seen, I've marked exams where there's a, a written response component that's like find the 120th term and I look on the scrap paper and the student has written 5, 9, 13, 17. You know, they've done that all the way down and they're keeping track. That's not what I'm after here. And who wants to do that? This leads into tomorrow. And I'm just going to ask the question. What is always for any arithmetic sequence? And I don't want you to shout out answers or give it away. I want you to think about it. What do you always add to the first term to get the 120th term? And it doesn't matter whether it's this sequence or a different sequence, but it's arithmetic. You always add the same thing to the first term to get the 120th term. And if you have an answer, just put your hand up and then down. And continue to do that. I mean, if you already put your hand up and down, you don't need to keep doing that. That's not what I mean, but as more and more people discover it. To get your mind going here, we're going to formalize this in the lesson tomorrow. What is it that you add to the first term in an arithmetic sequence to get the second term of an arithmetic sequence? What do we call that? Common difference. What would I add to the first term to get the third term? Apprentice? Oh, I thought you put up your hand. No? Okay. Two common differences. Because the, the third term is two positions away from the first term. What would we do? And, and more and more of you are going to get this as I continue to expand this. And this will be in our notes tomorrow. What do I add to the first term to get the fourth term? Well, the fourth term is three jumps away from the first term, so I would add three common differences. And the idea here is that if you were trying to determine a term number, like term number two, then you add one common difference. If you were trying to determine the third term, then you add two common differences. You're always adding one fewer common difference to the first term to get the nth term, to get that term you're after. So what we have to do here is that. We have to add 119 common differences to the first term to get the 120th. And I think some of you can visualize this in your head that if I drew out 120 blanks, and you started on the first blank, how many of these would you have to draw until you got to the 120th term? You'd have to draw one, two, three, 119 of them. And that allows us to algebraically solve the problem because the first term is five, and the common difference, I'm really going under the assumption here, everybody, that you can look at this and tell me the common difference is four. I don't think I need to really justify that. So we take 4 times 119, which is 440, plus 38, uh, sorry, plus 36, which is 476, plus the 5, which is 481, I think, but I just rambled that off. Can you confirm it's 486? Is that what I said? 41? 481. So the 120th term... It's 481, and that's it. So tomorrow what's going to happen is we're going to formalize this by developing equations, and there's a couple of equations that we'll learn tomorrow. 
the formulas or equations that you're going to be using are going to be ones that are given to you on a formula sheet so you don't have to memorize them. But this was just a basic introduction to the concept of what an arithmetic sequence is.